And our first speaker is Marian Nisbet, and she is from Glasgow, and she's come from Scotland today to talk to us about the bedroom tax, and she's an activist. <laughs> She's an activist with the Anti-Bedroom Tax Federation, so I introduce Marion. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, I only got to last night that I was speaking, so I'm like, <laughs> I can't even believe I'm speaking at Marxism, so just bear with me. Um, I'm an unemployed disabled worker and I'm directly affected by the bedroom tax. Um, I've also, I'm also a member of the All Scotland Anti-Bedroom Tax Federation. Um, like many people, you know, I'm, I'm sick to death. Over the last few years, people with disabilities have been vilified, labelled as scroungers and skivers. We've been subjected to over 30 different benefit cuts and um, the humiliating ATOS assessment um, I've been subjected to that, and I can assure you it's got nothing to do with your ability to work. It's to keep you frightened and to humiliate you. Um, that's it, basically, you know. <clears throat> so, um, when they announced the bedroom tax, I think like an awful lot of people, I just said, that's it, this is the final straw, I've had enough. I want to tell you a wee bit about the reality of the bedroom tax. This is a loss of up to 25% of housing benefit and it is for many families and individuals the tipping point between rising food prices and ever increasing utility bills and everything else. It, it's just unbelievable and the reality of it is if you're deemed fit for work you get approximately £280 a month to live on. If you're unfortunate enough to have two spare rooms um, this means that you lose approximately £80 a month in housing benefit. Now, you could be the best money manager in the world and you couldn't make it work, you know? It's, it's just outrageous what they're asking people to do. 80% of the people that are affected are, are disabled individuals or, the, you know, the household has um, a disabled person in the house. But I think it's important to mention that 50% of the people that are claiming housing benefit are people who are actually working, and they're working for such disgracefully low wages that they have to claim this benefit. <laughs> so along, along with, for, with, with further welfare reforms like universal credit, this is set to cause absolute chaos and misery for the most vulnerable in our society, you know. The state tells us they have to do it because they need to reduce the welfare bill and they're going to reduce it by 500 million. They introduced the bedroom tax and on the same day they introduced a tax cut for millionaires that came to 610 million. So, you know, the, this is the same state that we're happy to spend 10 million burying a despicable warmonger, Thatcher. I could go on, but I won't. Um, they also are happy to spend 10 hundred billion, eh, sorry, 100 billion on Trident. So let's get one thing straight. This is get. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> this is getting absolutely nothing to do with saving money. It's part of the wider attack on welfare and it's a starting point of their dismantling of our welfare state. A welfare state that my parents were very proud of and one that I unfortunately took for granted. And it is also a blatant attack on social housing. How dare they attack the idea of a family home for working class people. Young people are no longer going to have the backup. You know, if life throws you a bad turn, you'll not be able to go back to your mum's because your mum will not have a spare room, you know. Um, disabled aunties are no longer entitled to a spare room if I get no well so that somebody can come and look after me. But the real, you know, what makes me really angry is that they're throwing these reforms out whilst they're sitting in their spare house, you know. Scoffing, scoffing for £180 a week food allowance, you know. That's what makes me so angry. They've got a spare house, they're getting their food allowance on top of 
their hundred, what is it, ten grand that they've just gave themselves today. I. <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, so basically, I'm here to tell you a wee bit about what we've been doing in Scotland um, as, as a fight back to this. The anti-bedroom tax movement has grown and it's been assisted by social media and a strong grassroots movement that is dominated by working class women, of which I'm one. Um, <laughs> I said to a Labour MP at the STUC conference last week on the bedroom tax, I'm no the only angry woman in this room and you better get your act together, sunshine. <laughs> um, so we've been organising countless meetings across the, across the country, um, very well attended. We had a demonstration in Glasgow with 8,000 people and that is the biggest demo that we've seen in George Square since the poll tax. We had a conference in April, we brought folk from all over Scotland together and we formed the Scotland Anti-Bedroom Tax Federation. Govan Law Centre have presented a petition to the Scottish Parliament a couple of times um, requesting a change in Scots law which would basically just mean that the arrears would be treated as ordinary debt, um, removing the threat of eviction. I had to shout at quite a lot of men in suits outside the parliament, but eventually um, they have uh, they've moved it to their welfare reform committee. So, you know, we're getting somewhere. As I say, the STUC organised this special conference and this Labour um, MSP told us that we can't ask these vulnerable people to break the law. And I stood up and I tell them, I says, I'm one of these vulnerable people and so far you've taken my job, you've taken my DLA and now you want my house. I've got nothing to lose. You know, um, I'm, Give me a um, we've, lobbied, we've lobbied the housing associations, we've encouraged the workers and the trade unionists to come out and join us. Um, in South Lanarkshire, um, they sent out eviction letters and it was met with so much fury um, that they had they done a U-turn and they sent out an apology letter. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and Dundee and, and the Glasgow Trade Councils have affiliated to the, the Federation, along with uh, Glasgow, Unite, Unison, I can't remember, too many to go through. Um, but most importantly, we've created an anti-eviction army with every area creating its own group, but with strong links through the Federation. And this is so that we can create a human wall to protect the vulnerable should the sheriff be silly enough to attempt an eviction. We've got forum for this. We've got forum for this in Glasgow. In 1915, the women of Glasgow organised a rent strike. And at the height of this strike, up to 95% of the rents were only being paid. Prominent figures such as Mary Barber organised and overcame the sectarian and cultural differences within the communities, created a united front backed by trade unions of the Red Clyde side. This campaign was successful, you know, and, and we intend um, to, make, to make our campaign as successful. I'm proud to be a part of the 21st century version of Mrs Barber's army. And we, we have a wee saying. Whoever we saying, um, I'm for Govan Hill in Glasgow and at the very first meeting of the Federation, another woman called Fiona Jordan stood up and she'd never spoken in public before, but she says, if you stand with me, I'll stand with you. And it's as simple as that, you know, even if you're not affected by the bedroom tax, we want you to be offended by it, you know, and, and come out and join us. Um, during the poll tax, there wasn't a single... Um, Eviction, sorry, there wasn't a, um, a, a single warrant sale completed in Glasgow and we're determined to keep our good reputation and by any means necessary, we will stop evictions due to the bedroom tax arrears. So what do you need to do? You need to get out into your community, you need to get into the schemes, you need to encourage folk to get angry and get organised. Chap doors, reach these vulnerable women and families. I've been that woman sitting, closing the curtains, 
drop my diazepam or whatever, you know, a bottle of wine and going, how the hell do I cope? And I'm not that woman anymore, but see, for every woman that's gobby enough to stand here and shout, there's thousands sitting going, how the hell am I going to manage? So chap their doors, make it clear to them that they're no longer alone, encourage political activism, encourage civil disobedience, join the global fight against austerity, Let's try to make fear change sides from Cairo to Castle Milk. Thanks very much. For I, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is, uh, who is Maria Gargala, who has come from Barcelona to join us today, from Catalonia. She's, she's a, a librarian, a leading activist in the CGT Union and a member of the Revolutionary Socialist Organization En Lucha. So welcome, Mireia. Thank you. Today, in a Spanish state, there are over 6 million people unemployed, 27% of active, active population, nearly a third of the population are now living under the poverty line, which today means a total of 12,741,434 people. 500 evictions take place every day in Spain, while 3.4 million homes are empty. I live in the same country where Amancio Ortega lives, one of the richest men in Europe. His fortune amounts to 39,000 million euros. This is more than all the money received in social benefits by unemployed. I live in a country where the government has cut 10,000 million euros from the public health and education budgets and at the same time has increased the defense budget by 30%. Of course, we all know here that this does not affect the school that govern, government mis, ministers, children attend nor the health service that they will use where they will be ill. And the only solution, the only solution that the president of Catalonia gives us is to emigrate, to go to London and serve coffees. The way things are going, we will soon have a branch of a lucha in London. <laughs> Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And, <laughs> and in this appalling situation, they still have the nerve to tell us that we have lived beyond our means. <laughs> we should remember that 84% of these dead, they tell us we all have to pay off is a private debt, mostly created by the banks and private companies. The debt owned by the public sector amounts to only 60%. And as else, elsewhere, most of this public debt has been generated to save failed banks, to eliminate toxic assets, and to restructure the finance sector. And of course, in the Spanish state, as elsewhere, those, those responsible for this debt have converted their private debt into a public debt. Now, the existence of this debt has been used by the Troika to impose vicious austerity, austerity policies which have led to devastating cuts in basic services such as health and education. Faced with this situation where the interests 
of the markets are put before the interests of the great mass of the population, we say the only solution in the Spanish state and everywhere else is not to pay a debt that is not ours, that we have not caused. Recently, we have had a good example of such resistance in Catalonia. In the town of Badalona, where we have lots of comrades, the local people have managed through permanent mobilization and a struggle to force the local town council to become the first public institution in the state to declare the public debt as illegitimate. As we all know, the economy is not an abstract question for experts, but a highly political one, a highly ideological one. What is posed is who control the resources that we, the working class, create. Our interests as workers clash directly with the interest of the European Central Bank and the internationally monetary fund. Is us or them? Is our health service, our education, our social service, or their profits? For this reason, we, the precarious, the women, youth, and all workers have to struggle so that the cause of the crisis, their crisis, does not fall on our shoulders. To meet, to, two minutes, okay. to meet this challenge, we need workers, workers' unity. This is the moment to extend and generalize resistance and not isolate each particular struggle. I am sure that it won't surprise you that the bureaucracy of the main trade unions in a Spanish state is not uniting workers so they can resist but the rank and file, along with the smaller, more combative unions, are connecting with sectorial struggles and can lead to their radicalization. We have to turn even the more militant, militant unions upside down and understand that it is necessary to modernize their structures and include the more precarious sectors, as, uh, such as call center workers or women cleaners, that do not fit simply with the prototype of the industrial worker. Even inside my own union, the CGD, which is a radical union, we have understood in the IT coordinating committee, Coordinadora de Informatica, of which I am a member, that we need to create new structures. This does not mean that other more traditional methods still remain indispensable above all strikes, but strikes where the workers control what is happening through mass democratic assemblies. The ruling class tries hard to convince us that strikes are not useful, that trade unions are useless, and that the workers in our sector will never be mobilized. mobilized. Our answer was clear. We had a strike in Hewlett Packard where the vast majority of the staff stopped working. We had important picket lines with more than 300 workers at the, head work at the headquarters of the company in San Cugat. <clears throat> We didn't obtain a complete victory, but we forced the company to, remo to remove the worst measures, and we understand the struggle as a fundamental tool. All these struggles show us the road to take. We have our own tools that we are constructing in the course 
of these struggles because the struggle is our school and where we educate ourselves. We, <laughs> we as a women, have to be a central part in this fight because we are doubly affected by these cuts and austerity. The conservative governments want to send us back to the kitchens. They want us at home. They want us to supply the social rights that they are robbing us. The social... <laughs> the social rights that our grandmothers want for us in the street, but also in their homes. They want to relegate us to a second-class citizenship. They want to decide for us, decide of our bodies, even, even in our beds. And I say to the president of Catalonia, I love who I want to love. <laughs> The right is converting our bodies into an ideological battlefield by trying to dramatically reduce abortion rights. But women fighting in the street have paralyzed their law. Yeah. <laughs> Tories, gentlemen of the right, we will not go back to our homes. We will decide who we want to love and we will control our bodies. <laughs> we have to fight against sexism, not only soci society in general, but also inside our trade unions and our organizations at the same time. At the, at, the same, at the same time as we are fighting against cuts and against suckings. After all, we need a new world and a different way of relating and love. We need victories, we need energy and enthusiasm. We all need to fight wherever we are. Above all, we need an alternative to this rotten system, a fighting anti-capitalist anti alternative. The workers united will never be defeated. The workers united will never be defeated. Okay, our next speaker, as he makes his way to the microphone, I will introduce him, is Jerry Hicks. <laughs> Jerry is a Unite activist, and he recently was the runner up in the election for General Secretary, where he polled 36% of the vote. <laughs> And we're delighted that he's joining us tonight. Thank you, Jerry. Now you see me. Now you don't. Now you see me. Now you don't. If there's a vote this evening, I come with a block vote of 79,819. Um, it may not be common knowledge, I'm not the most disciplined of comrades. I apologise in advance. Chair, if you pass the two minutes, please slip. And you ignore it totally. Uh, and uh, I uh, misread it. <laughs> uh, I, tr I tried to imagine uh, making the speech tonight, and I sort of thought, well, how about being the sort of wedding speech, and when there's sort of a nervousness in the audience about the one that gets up that you're never really sure what they're going to say. Well, well, for Ian Allison, rest. I'm not going to tell everyone your darkest secrets. 
Well, not tonight, anyway. But for the organisers of uh, Marxism, you must be furious to hold such an event when there's simply nothing much happening around the world or here in Britain, of course, if you leave to one side. In Syria and Egypt and Brazil and the bedroom tax and privatisation of education and health and Royal Mail or the 23-year-old that was killed by the police last night by Taser. And then, Falkirk, what a tizzy McCluskey and Miliband got themselves into there. Do you know the train crash that was waiting to happen called Falkirk? Of all the things to fall out over, wouldn't you expect the General Secretary of the biggest union in the country, the most powerful General Secretary in the country to fall out with the leader of the Labour movement over their failure to pledge to scrap the bedroom tax? <laughs> Wouldn't you think the leader of Unite would fall out with, De with Ed, nearly said David then, Ed <laughs> Murray Bund over their refusal to repeal the anti-union laws? Wouldn't you think? No. No. They choose to fall out on the selection of an MP or prospective parliamentary candidate in Falkirk. McCluskey says to get more working people into politics. Wouldn't you know? You know, this particular one, I have no axe to grind. Well, not this time is an appointed Unison official who works for Tom Watson and shares a flat with both McCluskey and Watson, I'm told. <laughs> nothing ordinary and probably nothing working class. And almost all with the other ones that Unite have backed, I think, Michael Crick has discovered on our behalf. And then there's Andrew Murray. Not the Andrew Murray in Unite, who is the uh, Chief of Staff. There's a title for an appointed union official, Chief of Staff. No, I'm referring to uh, Andy Murray of Wimbledon fame. And the BBC, actually followed by Cameron yesterday, claimed that uh, Andy Murray was the, uh, the first uh, British tennis player to win Wimbledon for 77 years, completely forgetting, of course, Virginia Wade, but she's a woman, and they can't possibly be as equal, can they? Can they? The BBC, the BBC, though, mysteriously, they covered their tracks, all right. They said Andrew Murray is the first British tennis player to win Wimbledon in shorts. Because, I kid you not, they said this, because Fred Perry wore long trousers and Virginia Wade wore a skirt. <laughs> However, on the back of this fabulous success, I didn't rush out and buy a tennis racket. No, not for me. I'd already spent all my money on a cycling shirt following uh, the uh, Wiggins and Victoria Pendleton success. But the point, and there is, stay with me, <laughs> the point that I'm making is we are influenced and we make choices and decision. For me, it was a cycling shirt. If you make those choices and those decisions in the bubble of a committee, be it trade union or otherwise, or you make those decisions in the bubble of a party, political or otherwise, you can come to a poor analysis. You can make skewed decisions. You can think that some things are more popular than they are. For you know, I was told that Len McCluskey was the most popular general secretary of a trade union. He was very popular 
And you know, you can overplay the popularity stakes, although I'm not, uh, not don't doubt that the CC at the moment are uh, blighted with overpopularity stakes. But you can <laughs> play the overpopularity stakes because for how did Len McCluskey manifest its popularity? At the behest of Labour, he pulled forward the election timetable for the biggest union in the country, the election, the only election everyone else is appointed by three years at the behest of Labour and Ed Miliband. Yeah, strange now. He said to avoid the embarrassing clash and any embarrassing clash with Labour. Falkirk, Falkirk, Falkirk. <laughs> you know, he did it. He manoeuvred. He brought it forward three years. It was a snap election, all in a bid to be unopposed. And he nearly got away with it. No, but for us, kid. <laughs> so the election was on. And then there's the choice. Some, to their discredit, and in my view, their shame. We're on the wrong side of history. Two candidates. One who believes in appointments. £122,000 per year, at least. Who's wedded to labour, no matter what the protestations. Pay up front, unconditional. The other. A rank and file candidate. A grassroots left candidate. You we're the candidate. There is no choice to make. But some made the wrong choice. You, to your great credit, and a number of others, workers' power, are on the right side of history. <laughs> so the election's on! The election's on! And how did it go, this snap election, with the smallest timescale of all? Not once. Not once did Len McCluskey, this most popular of general secretaries, who had hundreds of officials at his disposal, would meet head to head. Can you imagine why? If he has all the arguments. This candidate spent nearly £300,000 on their campaign. We, we spent 4000 I'm still waiting for some of the pledges to come through. <laughs> But if you thought that was grotesque enough, I tell you, our campaign moved, moved like no other in the factories, from the inside, from the outside, people in Unite, not in Unite, in the high street banks, in the bus depots and garages. It moved like no other and they knew it. And how did this red Len, popular Len, react? Let me tell you, with vile, bile, with innuendo, with slander, Red Len turned to Red Baiting, and he then lost all credibility to call himself left because he courted the right wing vote. In my final two minutes. <laughs> However, what is the solution to the uh, crisis? Well, is it the tried and trusted? Unite the resistance, you fight for jobs, shop stewards network, anti cuts committees, Tusk. Those are the things that they're going to inspire the 17.2 million people. They watched Andrew Murray, and they're not all public schoolboys, though, 17.2 million. They might not all call for the overthrow of the system, but I tell you, the majority of them would be against the privatisation of Royal Mail. Yeah. <laughs> or is it the revamps? The tired and busted, perhaps. The same faces, maybe different hats. The left unity, eight or 10,000 names, maybe that's the solution. Though I struggle, 
I struggle. I'm not sure. Is, is it not similar to Tusk? People's Assembly. Yes, 4,000 people. It's true. But you know, on a wet Tuesday night in December, I can watch Bristol Rovers play Hartlepool, and more than 4,000 will turn up. <laughs> I'm not saying these things to decry. I'm saying these things because I'm not sure. What I know, what I know, is 38 Degrees was popular. UK Uncut is popular. Flash mobs are popular. Occupy was popular. And imagine, at the height of the Occupy movement, if the General Secretary of the biggest union in the country had taken a Unite tent outside St Paul's Cathedral and demanded <laughs> the fighters handed it back. Imagine, imagine. In my final minute, Chair, you'll be glad to know. What I know is this. A rank-and-file grassroots candidate has stood for General Secretary of the biggest union in this country on three occasions. Three occasions. Every time confounding the critics. It was me on this occasion. It could have been any of us. I kid you not. It's what we stood for. It's what we said was in the hearts and minds of people. And each time we stood, our vote increased. Our message remained the same. Firm in principle, flexible in tactic. Election of all officials, answerable, accessible, accountable. The end to appointed system. The General Secretary... The General Secretary, on an average wage, the same as the members they represent, not the two, three thousand pound a week, every week, living a life unlike our members. To confront the anti-union laws, to break them where necessary, we've been criminalised. It's not us that's changed, it's the law all around us. And we called for the scrapping of Trident. 75 billion, it's been said 100 billion, I'll take 100. <laughs> Create a million green jobs. Give hope to the million under the age of 25 who are unemployed. This was our message. You'd still have money left over for houses, for hospitals and schools. This was our message. And on the last occasion, just 16 weeks ago, in my final 30 seconds, <laughs> 80,000 votes, enough votes to fill Wembley Stadium. And next time, whoever stands, whoever is the rank and file candidate, I predict this, we will get enough votes to fill Hyde Park. And next time, we will win. In the meantime, we build. We build the rank and file movement. We build the grassroots movement. We go back to where we went. I have, I have in my last five seconds an anecdote from Leeds. It comes in two parts. I spent the day in Leeds with four students, two of which we were members of the Unite from dawn to dusk. We toiled to meet Unite members. I felt, I tell you, like a thousand feet high, worth a million dollars, pounds or euros, whatever you wish. And as we wound our weary way home that night to the place that I was going to lay my head, the students flat, one of them whispered in my ear, don't worry, we've cleaned up, we knew you were coming. <laughs> I was now their uncle. <laughs> but in Leeds, this one I found most inspiring. In Leeds University, there was a big placard and it said, the Institute of Endless Possibilities. And in Unite, we challenged the bureaucracy with the prospect of endless possibilities. And Marxism, this place, today, tonight, tomorrow, and until Monday morning, 
this place is the excellent, ideal place to discuss and seek the solutions, perhaps a different formula. That's the task, how simple it is for you. <laughs> but I'd like to say, now as I finish, it's my personal chance to thank all those that supported the election, our election campaign, especially those, and you know who you are, who worked so hard. And anyone who did involve themselves would know that we actually could have won on that last occasion. So my final quote is not from Marx or Lenin, it's not from Trotsky or Engels, it's Johnny Cash. <laughs> There's a whirlwind in the thorn trees, but it's hard for me to kick against the pricks. <laughs> and in my final task in this wedding meandering speech, it is simply this, to raise a toast to Marxism 2013. I give you Marxism 2013. <laughs> Next, I'm going to call Joe, Joe Cardwell, from the Socialist Workers' Party, member of the Central Committee. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, comrades. Um, it's actually usually, I think, at things like trade union conferences and party conferences and so on, that people start off with commemorating fallen comrades. I'd actually like to turn that around and celebrate the death of someone this year. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, I mean, come on, you know. <clears throat> we at least have one more cheer out of it, can't we? But of course the problem is, is that while she's gone, we're still dealing with her successor under uh, the guise of David Cameron, an Eton boy who uh, is trying to lecture uh, people over party funding and I know people have made some raised some issues around party funding already but I just really want to look at what happens in the Tory party because I think the idea whatever you think of Labour the idea that we should take lessons or Labour should take lessons from people like the Conservative Party over Tory funding I think we should reject that totally I don't know whether you've heard of the Bamford family at all uh, they are the family of JCB fame. Uh, so Anthony Bamford, Mark Bamford, George Bamford. There's also other donations into the Tory party from JCB Bamford excavators, JCB Research, JCB World Brown, Br Brands, all donate to the Tory party. Just if you tie it all up, in the last 10 years, £4 million from one family into the Conservative Party. I mean, the reason why they break these down into these different individuals is you have to be a sleuth, actually. I mean, it took somebody a couple of years to really research and track down, actually, the funding uh, of, the, of the Conservative Party. And they found that 15 families account for a third of all of the Tory Party donations. I mean, really... Now, you contrast this to the funding of Labour, in which we find that actually it works out, on average, of a contribution of six pence per worker per year. And David Cameron, you're trying to tell us about funding of parties. I mean, this is a disgrace that these people are allowed to do that. The problem isn't a few wor of workers giving a few pence a year to the Labour Party. The problem is a tiny number of individuals who are getting away with the most revolting corruption and greed and getting a massive return for their investment from this government. <laughs> and I'll tell you what else, comrades, we see this really across Europe, isn't it? The ruling class really trying to set the agenda, an absurd agenda. I mean, one of the biggest lies, of course, that we're hearing around austerity is that we're all in this together. Uh, clearly, we can see actually the rich are doing very well out of austerity. Thank you very much. In Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, workers are facing massive and savage cuts. But actually, the Troika are actually making interest off the back of the loans that are actually forcing people into poverty in these, in these countries. All in it together? I don't think so. 
And it's always the wrong way round because the people who didn't create the crisis are the people who are being attacked and the people who are being blamed for it. And it's not just around, you know, we've heard of some of the incredible stuff that's happened around the, the bedroom tax, but also when you think about the attacks on benefits claimants full stop and on the disabled, I mean, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, I read a story about a man who found a novel way, actually, of getting around the ATOS assessments, a guy called George Brumby, who can't work because he has chronic arthritis. Uh, when he was assessed by ATOS, of course, they found him fit to work. And they said in the report, and he challenged the inaccuracies in the report, that he could actually climb stairs. It turns out there wasn't even a set of stairs in the place where they did the assessment for them to even show whether the man could climb stairs or not. So George Brumby actually tried to challenge this and put an appeal against this, and during this process actually developed quite a severe depression in terms of doing this as well. And no longer able to wait for the appeal, he put a new claim in for, for his benefits and a new claim to be assessed. And when they assessed him, they actually found this time round that he did actually deserve those benefits in the first place. But what was it that tipped the balance, comrades, this time round? The depression that he developed between these two assessments was what tipped the balance and gave that man back his benefits. This is what they are doing to people in the process of their attacks on our, on our class. And I bet you that George Brumby doesn't feel like we're all in this together. On top of that, I mean, I know people have mentioned the, uh, the MP's pay, but I mean, you should rest assured uh, that despite the fact that we're going to see a 10% rise in their pay packets, we shouldn't worry because the uh, £15 dinner expenses are being scrapped. <laughs> so actually, it's all right, you know, some of the expenses are going to be stopped and so on and so forth. But really quite revolting, isn't it, when you think about the public sector pay workers who are experiencing either a pay freeze or, or 1%. I mean, they showed in the figures that the average worker's pay has actually increased by 2%. I say average because there's clearly people who have actually had massive, uh, who've had cuts as well. Uh, the RPI at the moment is currently 3.2%. It really, what it means is on average that people are experiencing a 1.2% pay cut. And the RPI, I actually think, is quite a dubious figure because the way in which prices hit the poorest, you look at how much the housing prices are contributing towards RPI. Actually, I think people are being hit harder every single time. So our average is pay increases are around 2%. What do you think the average is for senior directors' pay? in this country. I mean, would you wager lower or higher than, than what we're seeing? Higher, I could almost do, you know, play your cards right on this one. But uh, yeah, 17.8% actually is the average increase in senior directors' pay. And not just that, but their bonuses are now the equivalent to 37.8% of their salaries. Now, when you look across managers, managers across industry actually are apparently similar average to workers in that they have a 2% uh, pay rise. But look at the way these people hide things. Because again, when you look at managers' bonuses, which aren't included when you look at their average pay, 30% is the average bonus for, for managers in industry inside this, inside this country. And of course, they have ways and means, don't they, of hiding this wealth, not just in bonuses, but let's look at tax. I don't know whether people saw the front page of the mirror, where they look at the percentage of tax that is paid by people in this country, um, you can think that you realise that 35%, uh, the rich pay 35% in tax. What do you think it is for the, the poorest? Do you think it's higher than that or, or lower than that? 36% in tax paid by the poorest in this country, while the rich are paying 35%. This is just really unbelievable, I think, and it's you know, just a picture of a massive injustice and really a world turned upside down. The rich paying less tax, increasing their bonuses, and their representatives in Parliament increasing their own, their own pay. I mean, the idea of people like Gove, Osborne, Hunt getting higher pay is just one of the most sickening, most sickening things. And look at what Gove is doing to our young people. This is where, you know, he's deserving of his big pay bonus, according to, uh, according to the rich. 
You know, it's not just that we have the privatisation of education, the selling off of our schools. It's that not just that they couldn't put enough people off going to university by introducing fees or slashing EMA or cutting EMA. They couldn't quite put enough working class people off getting into universities. And so therefore what they've decided to do is to make a change in the GCSE gradings to actually introduce further testing into primary schools. Our children are doing too well and the Tories and the Eton boys want to test them into oblivion, want to push their grade down through changing GACSEs. They want to make our children fail. This is what they're getting paid extra for. And Jeremy Hunt. I mean... The money this man is going to get for selling off what has to be one of the best things, the most incredible things this country has ever built in the form of the National Health Service. I mean, really remarkable when you think that the levels of debt following the Second World War in Britain, much higher than the levels of debt we're experiencing now, and actually the National Health Service was built in that time. And it changed the lives, actually, of every working class person in this country. Every person. And therefore, it's something we have to fight for and fight to keep hold of. Because whilst we look at hospitals, doctors' surgeries, and whilst we understand that these are places that make us better, where our children are born, where our elderly and our grandmas and grandfathers are looked after, these people look at our health service and they see pound signs in their eyes. This is the difference between us and them and the way in which they want to run things. And actually, you know, when you think, I mean, goodness, the, the lies that come out around how we justify what's going on, or the problems around the National Health Service, apparently not the crisis, apparently some of the problems now are health tourism. This is where they are now looking to point the finger and put the blame. Not apparently on a massive defence budget of billions, actually, where you know, we can afford to go and still around and occupy places like Afghanistan, but no, the real problem, apparently, in funding our National Health Service is someone that wasn't born here, who might happen to fall ill while they're here, who might happen to have a heart attack or need treatment. This is apparently the problem. And therefore, when you think about the disgusting levels of racism that are being promoted by people like UKIP, I mean, what... A tr UKIP, let's not get started just on the details of UKIP, but UKIP is an organisation, a party, that actually wants to build seven new aircraft carriers. £48.3 billion pounds they would spend on this. This is half the funding of the National Health Service. And these people are trying to get us to blame immigrants and refugees for the problems of the National Health Service. I don't think so. And therefore, I think we have to resist massively not just austerity, but the racism that they are whipping up in order to try and divide and rule over us. Because actually, this is not just a feature here that is happening. Across Europe, we are seeing this. And we will hear from speakers across Europe, especially from our comrades in Greece, who are standing up to people like Golden Dawn. And what do we see here? The EDL trying to capitalise on the murder of Lee Rigby, trying to capitalise on the background of racism, actually, and trying to divide and trying to march. And that's why I feel so proud to be a part of Unite Against Fascism. Because actually... Across this country... We have stood up and we have fought back and we have stopped the EDL from capitalising on the racism that exists inside of this society. I am proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with my Muslim brothers and sisters in this country and actually I'm also going to be proud to be a part of the campaign Stand Up to UKIP. Because I tell you what, nobody else is standing up to UKIP at the moment. Not just Cameron, but Miliband. This pathetic man that calls himself an opposition. Frankly, the idea, the only thing that you did wrong, Miliband, was on immigration. is just a sick joke. Actually, the triangulation that is taking place here around this 
I think is something that we have to really be a part of resisting. And actually being part of that resistance, standing up against racism means we can stop them from walking all over us. And it's resistance that I want to come to now. Because actually the backdrop of what we are meeting in, the inspiration of the millions that we have seen in Turkey, the millions that we've seen out striking across Europe, I'm so looking forward to hearing about the struggles and the resistance in Brazil. Actually, these are all the things that we need to be looking at and inspiring us to fight back because austerity is hitting us, but it's hitting us at different times. Actually, we're not experiencing the same things in Greece, in Britain, in France, all at the same time. It's hitting us in different ways. And actually, when you look in Britain and the different phases of struggle that we have had here, first the student revolts, then the big TUC demonstration, then the millions out on strike in November, sabotaged by union leaders. But actually, we don't see just a set of workers who feel defeated. We see a set of workers, and you can tell this from some of the union conferences, from the vote that Jerry Hicks got in Unite, that people's conclusion is not that they can't fight and win, it's that they haven't got the right leadership in terms of fighting back and winning. <laughs> Therefore, don't tell me, don't tell me there isn't the will to resist inside this country, because I believe there is. The People's Assembly of 4,000, I think, was an incredible start to actually showing us that people do want to fight back and they do want to resist. But this is not generalised into an easy, organisable form, comrades, and that is what we have to fight and grapple with. Because actually, when the firefighters are balloting for strike action, we need to be there backing them up and fighting for a yes vote. When the teachers are going to be striking, are striking, when the civil servants strike, we have to be there to try and fan those flames of resistance. Yeah. And it may seem like these things are going to, this is a long way off, and who knows where struggle is going to break out from, but I don't believe that we should drop our slogan to fight for a general strike because I believe for actually millions of people it makes massive sense that we fight together. But you know what, comrades, the truth of it is, is that resistance is not enough. Egypt shows us that, doesn't it? Actually, we don't want to just resist what rottenness there is in this system. We want to fight for a better world. We want to fight for something different than actually what we have at this moment in time. And therefore, we have a dream of something different. We aspire to a world in which poverty and oppression is history. Actually, when you look at our comrades in Egypt who are fighting back, not just against the army, fighting back against sexism, fighting for liberation is a part of our tradition. We want to fight for women's liberation, gay liberation. We want to fight against racism. All of these things are a part of our tradition and a part of our dream for what we see inside of our future. And I want to just finish really with a poem by Bertolt Brecht. And it's called Questions from a Worker Who Reads. Who built Thebes of the seven gates? In the books you will find the name of kings. Did the kings haul up the lumps of rock? And Babylon, many times demolished, who raised it up so many times? In what houses of gold glittering lima did the builders live? Where, the evening that the wall of China was finished, did the masons go? Great Rome is full of triumphal arches. Who erected them? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Had Byzantium much praised in song, only palaces for its inhabitants. Even in fabled Atlantis, the night the ocean engulfed it, the drowning still bawled for their slaves. The young Alexander conquered India. Was he alone? Caesar beat the Gauls. Did he not even have a cook with him? <laughs> Philip of Spain wept when his armada went down. Was he the only one to weep? Frederick II won the Seven Years' War. Who else won it? Every page of victory. Who cooked the feast for the victors? Every ten years a great man. Who paid the bill? So many reports. So many questions. And I hope, comrades, that over the next few days in Marxism that we try and answer some of these questions. But not just that. I hope that you will join the Socialist Workers' Party in resisting not just capitalism, but fighting for a better world for everybody. OK, our last speaker, we are absolutely delighted that uh, Enrique Sanchez has flown over today from Brazil.
Thank you. Enrique is a socialist and an activist from Sao Paulo, and he's going to be our last speaker tonight. Thank you, Enrique. Good evening, or good afternoon in Brazil. <laughs> I'm handling this, this time, this, this change, but I'm okay, just kidding. Uh, it's a big response that we have after such impressive speeches to speak here. I remember the last time I was here, the first time five years ago, I was in the audience, and then I'm closing the, the opening rally. <laughs> a big, a big responsibility. Uh, 2008 was also the beginning of the capitalist crisis. Uh, austerity policies became a dogma uh, defended by IMF, governments, banks, mass media as the only solution to live the crisis uh, and provoked a, a major impact over workers and poor, poor people's lives across the whole world. As we know it, the crisis develop, de de developing and is developing in an uneven and combined way in Brazil, in the whole world in Brazil too. In Brazil, it's, uh, it's complicated because we have a joke, it's funny, but it's very real. We never had a welfare state. We have a, a bad welfare state. That's always that, that how it goes. And you know, you, now we have the Workers' Party in the government. Workers' Party, for who doesn't know, is a party, a Workers' Party, founded in the strike wave on the end, in the end of the 70s to the beginning of the 80s. It, it was an anti-capitalist, a radical party. And then today, you can define it. It, it embraced the neoliberal uh, economy, many measures that took from the right-wing parties. And in Brazil, the crisis had an impact, but not like in Europe, in Spain, in, in England, in, in, other, in other countries. I think that the government undertook a relative containment of the crisis. It made a credit boom, uh, supplementary income, income programs, uh, you have an unemployment decrease in Brazil. Uh, so when I uh, first talked with Jerry, uh, he asked me, oh, in Brazil, how, how it goes? If you ask, anyone asked me uh, two months ago, uh, on May, oh, it's going to be hundreds of uh, thousands of people in the streets. I mean, don't, don't be so optimistic. Brazil is not <laughs> in that mood. You, ha you, ha you have struggles, but not in that mood. It was a climate of popular euphoria created by the government, by the, the mass media, the official propaganda, but also of the living conditions. Uh, it's, uh, it's impossible to, to deny that some of poor people had a, ma a marginal, a very reasonable uh, improving in living conditions. But the rich con continue to gain continue to, to support the government, how to, to relate with this government. Because they have the, the support of the poor people, of the workers, of the bureaucracy, of the trade union bureaucracy, but also from the, from the rich people. It's very di difficult to, to relate with them. Uh, and then the, there is the World Cup. Uh, Brazil is the, they, they say, I don't know, the, so the country of the soccer. I, I prefer you because you invented the soccer created the soccer. But then you have the education, the health system in Brazil, that's the bad, fair state. And uh, the, the government says, oh, we can't improve the, the investments right now. We have to cut. Uh, we have to follow the, the policies of austerity. I, I am, IMF is in our back. And then World Cups uh, appeared. And the, and the states put uh, billions of, of, do, of Brazilian reais of dollars in World Cup stadiums. And then th th there was this contradiction to the population. So you don't have money to the public services and you have to for World Cup stadiums. That created a rage in the, in the population. Uh, and then the, the, the first signs of a breakdown in Brazilian economic growth that was in, in the past. Uh, I believe that you, most of you, followed what happened in, in June. It, it was sparked by the, the announcement in Sao Paulo of the public transport fares increasing in the fares in, for, for the mayor, that's from the Workers' Party municipal government, 
and the governor, that's the right-wing opposition party to, to Workers' Party. And then when they announced the MPL, that's a social movement in Brazil, free, free fire movement, translating to English, they defend the free public transport, the, the transport as a social right, like education, health, and on other issues. They, they started to call many, they started to call protests against this, this public, transfer, public transport fare increase. And then, in the first moment, there were some young people, some radicalized young workers, but one wasn't, weren't massive as the, the thing what was going on in the movement. Uh, then, uh, on June 11th, I think, June 11th, there was a brutal police repression against the, I think, uh, 10,000 of activists. To me, <laughs> already. Uh, and then, I think the, the mass media was against the movement. Oh, they are all vandals. They are all people who doesn't care for, for transport and public services. One journalist was arrested for having vinegar. Vinegar. Yeah, the, the policeman said, oh, vinegar is dangerous. You can have a, <laughs> a vinegar. We, we start to call the vinegar revolt <laughs> and struggle for legalization of vinegar. <laughs> and then, but, and then the mayor and the governor, the, the governor said, oh, we can't, we can't decrease the, 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 the transport fares. It's an expert issue. It's a technical, technical decision. You, you, you can't decrease that. And then she, the, the next day, oh, we have to decrease. It's, it's becoming possible that you have hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people in street in Sao Paulo, in Rio, in the main cities of Brazil, but also in small towns that I think that they never had a protest like before. And then another issue is start to come. The, the cost of, of living standards, the, to the working and poor people, the quality of public services that are very bad, then the policy violence. Uh, the policy in Brazil is still military. Uh, it's different from the most of countries. It, it kill, it, I think that the, the police that more kills black and poor people in the world, it's possible. And today, right now, to, to be more exact, it's occurring a national day of, of uh, mobilizations and strikes across Brazil, called by all trade union federations, by the main social movements, the trade union bureaucracy is pressured by the rank and file movement. That's very important, I think. <laughs> but I think what, what can shape the future of movement is the rank and file movement and the pressure from below, the self-organization in workplaces, in suburbs. There were protests, one minute, I will try to, to resume. The, there were protests in suburbs in Sao Paulo and Rio. There, there are focus of popular organizations that, never, that, that never, wa never were in the past. But you have accumulation of struggles from, from the recent period. There was the, the rebellion in Giral. Giral is an electrical, electrical thing that uh, it, I think uh, it has 40,000 40, of workers. And they working like in, in almost in slavery conditions. That that was very complicated. And the trade union bureaucracy was against the the workers. So <laughs> you see how how it goes in in the social movement in Brazil. Uh, well, uh, just just to conclude, I think I, I just uh, I don't like to, to use quotes. I, I <laughs> not. My, my, hab my habit isn't a great song of Johnny Cash or, or a brilliant poem from Brecht. <laughs> but I think that uh, Jose Carlos Mariategui, a Peruvian Marxist and one of the most creative thinkers of Latin American Marxism, he wrote an article in 1924 about the United Front politics and Workers' Day in Peru. He said, we are, we are, we are still few to divide ourselves. We can repel masses to revolution with dogmatic quarrels. We can use our, our capacities in squander time, but in fight the social order, its institutions, its, its injustices, and its crimes. 
I, it was written in 1924, but I think it's still valid for, for our struggle. I think all the movements of global resistance, the, the revolutions in Egypt, in, in Tunisia, the fighting in Turkey now, the rebellions and general strikes in Greece, the indignados in Spain, all of them inspired us and gave us confidence to go to the streets. Uh, I think we are entering now in a dilemma that posing the following question. That's for, for the global uh, anti-austerity movement. We, we have to keep the resistance, but how we can go further how we can win, how we can pose real alternatives to capitalism. I think that that's a dilemma that isn't easy, isn't, isn't a new one, but we, ha we have to, to advance. It's not a recipe, there is not a recipe or formula to advance in that sense, in fight against capitalism, against austerity. And I think in, in, as, as revolutionary socialists, uh, we, we, have, we are learning, we learned so much from these new anti-capitalist movements and struggles. Uh, in, in an, in an, uh, but is, there is still a lot to learn in day-to-day -day political practice. In a dialectic sense, revolutionary teaching comes from daily learning with the class struggles in the past and now. There is the grassroots activity, uh, there, there is to be so much patience, no sectarianism, critical openness, are as much as important as the necessity to maintain our tradition and identity. But traditions are always reinvented, and know how to, invent how our, know how to reinvent ourselves is a fundamental step to the huge task of bringing more dozens of millions to the streets and worker pl workplace, and go further against crisis, austerity, and capitalism. That's, that's it.